Honey, have you seen this one? Oh, will you look at that? All right, kids, we got 10 seconds. 10 seconds. Is that your mom's sweater? Well, we must have done something right. Everybody. It's great to be here with you today. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Seth. I'm the pastor here at Second Story. It's great to be able to welcome you all in worship today. Didn't these guys do a fabulous job leading us up here today? That's just so much fun. That's my favorite part of the week. I'm not even kidding, man. I could do that all day long. That's so much fun. Well, listen, we have been in a series called Insta Family uh, over these last number of weeks where we've been talking about the fact that none of our families, none of our families are as perfect as maybe we sometimes portray them as being or would even like them to be. And, and today we're wrapping up this series by talking about an ingredient that God wants to kind of bake into our families um, that is the number one secret to success. It is like the biggest thing all of us need in order to do family in the way that he's called us to do it, and that is forgiveness. We're going to talk a little bit about forgiveness today. And um, I've just got two verses for you today that I want to start things off with. How many of you know that those are the most dangerous sermons? When the pastor only has, what is it, something like, you know, uh, like one verse, three points, four hours, something like that. It's, it gets a little, gets a little long. But no, uh, we're just going to do two verses here at the very beginning. Um, and I'm going to be in Luke chapter 6. So if you have your Bible with you, go ahead and open that up and we can look at that together. If not, don't worry about it the, the words are going to be on the screen in back of me. But it says this. It says, Then Peter came to him, meaning Jesus, and he asked, Lord, how often should I forgive someone who sins against me? I'm thinking, seven times? No, not seven times, Jesus replied. But 70 times seven. My message title for today is we always do retakes. We always do retakes. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, thank you so much uh, for the fact that your grace is more generous than ours. Thank you for the fact that it's in families that we really learn about the need for grace. And, and I pray today that you'd give a special measure of it to us as we walk through these verses and think about our families and what they mean and, and, and kind of how we can walk in forgiveness at a deeper level together. We pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, throughout this series, um, I have mentioned more than once that, that since I was a kid, really, photography is something that for me, um, it started out as something as a hobby when I was really young and kind of gradually became something more over the course of my life. And over the past 10 or 11 years or so, I've operated, I've owned and operated my own photo studio. And, and when I first started getting photograph uh, requests for weddings, like photography requests for weddings, um, I'm going to be really honest with you. I didn't want to do it. I didn't want to start doing wedding photography. Wedding photography to me has always been something that's really scary. I don't care how good you are with a camera. It's kind of a scary thing. And part of it is just the volume of it. It's an all-day commitment. We're talking thousands of pictures, big-time hours, ready to commit to that thing. So it's a lot to prepare for, and it's a lot to get ready for, and, and that's a part of it. And that was a part of my nervousness. Another part of it was just the expectations that people have around their wedding photography. I don't know if you've noticed this, but a lot of times people expect you to 
like make them look like they belong on the cover of Vogue or like Minnesota Bride when, I mean, I'm, I'm just going to throw this out there for you. Like I may or may not be able to do that. That might or might not be realistic based on the subject that I'm shooting in front of my lens. I'm just going to leave that right there. All God's people said, amen, amen. But the main reason I was always scared of getting into wedding photography it, it is primarily because this is a one-time event. It's a, it's a one-time event. And if anything, I mean, anything goes wrong here today. As a photographer, I mean, listen, you mess up the lighting on something, you miss a family combo you were supposed to get, you, you like have a hard drive that fails or a memory card that fails. If you miss some critical moment that happened in a part of the room when you weren't there, if anything goes wrong at all, this is not a repeatable or like recreatable kind of moment. I can reshoot someone's senior pictures. I can reshoot portrait sessions. I can reshoot with a family, all kinds of stuff. It's not ideal, but we can do that. But when it comes to weddings, I mean, the truth is, these are one-time deals that if anything at, at all goes wrong on my end, I am now responsible for screwing up someone's lifelong memories of this day and of this like most important moment of their life. And that's a lot of pressure. That's a lot of pressure to live with, man. That's, that's hard. I didn't want to get into wedding photography because it's a genre of photography where there are no retakes. There just aren't retakes. And that's a scary place. There's no safety net. And that's a scary place to operate from. But it's always been funny to me because I'm not just a photographer. Uh, it's also been funny to me as a pastor, and I watch all of these things go down from that lens, or even just forget the pastor hat for a minute. Let's take that off. Let's just step back for a second, because there's a whole other ironic part of this that I've noticed just as a fellow human at, on planet Earth, okay? I know that in this marriage that I'm in the process of documenting with my camera, retakes are what life is all about. It's what life is all about. Weddings are only one day in a couple's life. And there's a lot of pressure and there's a lot of money involved in making it absolutely perfect. But the perfection of that one day stands in stark contrast to the fact that the marriage and the family that's going to come from that day, that's anything but perfect, right? That's going to be anything but perfect. We get all caught up in making it look like it's a little slice of perfection out of Minnesota Bride, when in reality, what we're creating probably belongs on the cover of Minnesota Crazy, right? Maybe, maybe like Minnesota Flawed, that's a nice way to say it. In some cases, we're just, we, we're, we're like, we're vying for the cover of Minnesota Brokenness, like right there, it's just that, that's what we've got. Why? Because life isn't a magazine cover. Life is not an Instagram reel, and it never, it never goes according to script. Not ever. A couple of weeks ago, our family took my mom out for lunch on Mother's Day, and my niece, Cece, asked my mom a really great question. I thought it was a great question she asked her at lunch. She said, Grandma, would you say that the life you're living today is the life that you expected to be living when you were younger? And it sparked this kind of great conversation around our lunch table that afternoon. And I, I, I shared with the group that here's the, here's the funny thing that I've learned about those kinds of things in life. I've learned that both the best parts of my life, like the happiest, most joy-filled things in my life, as well as the hardest things in life, the biggest challenges in life, the biggest gut wrenches in life, both of those things, neither of them are things I would have ever expected. Neither of them are something I would have been able to predict when I was younger. And I think that gets more true as I get older. Have you noticed that about your life? That the, the highs and the lows are things that you never would have ever predicted. And because of that, life requires retakes. It just does. You're not going to always get it right. You're not going to be able to predict what comes up, let alone control it. I mean, listen... Forget your family for a minute, just your own personal reality, okay? And then let that bleed into your family relationships. It's not going to match up with your expectations. It's not in both good ways 
and hard ways. The family that comes out of that wedding day isn't going to look like the Instagram reel or the magazine cover that they thought it would. It never does. People are going to let you down. You are going to let people down. Doing life with other broken human beings at any kind of conceivable level, having any kind of relationship with anybody, you know what you can plan on for sure? Disappointment. People are going to disappoint you. You're going to disappoint other people. Things are going to go wrong. And if, if you're expecting that it's not going to, I'm just telling you that's a really unrealistic pressure to live with in your family. That's a pressure that, that's the, really like the lie of Instagram, isn't it? That life looks a lot more perfect and a lot more curated than it really is. Nobody can shoot under that kind of pressure. Nobody lives up to it, let, let alone kind of can keep it going over any sort of period of time. It's just not realistic. Jesus asked Peter, or Peter asked Jesus, hey, Jesus, how many retake sessions should I do? Should you give it seven? I mean, seven's a lot, right? Seven's a lot. I just need to know. Should I give people seven retake opportunities? I can't imagine shooting a wedding seven times. Can you? I don't think that's a really great business plan for a wedding photographer to be able to tell them, listen, up to seven times, man, we're just going to keep doing this. I'm just going to keep shooting this until we get it right. That's my business plan. That is what I do. I'm just going to keep kind of going and going and going day after day, shot after shot till we get it right. That's going to be our business model. You think that'll sell? I don't. Most, most couples that I've encountered, what they want to know is, how quickly can you get it perfect? Being one shot, right? How quickly and easily can you get it perfect? And if they're not confident that you can do that, you're not going to get hired. You just won't. Jesus told Peter, listen, not just seven times. Mm -mm. 70 times seven. So the implication that Jesus is giving here is that we're talking infinite retakes, okay? We're talking infinite reshooting, infinite retouching, infinite recreating, infinite recommitting, infinite editing in Photoshop, praise God, okay? That's the plan. That's, that's, that's the plan. We do retakes all day long and all day strong. His retakes are new every morning. From the rising of the sun to the going down of the same, the name of the Lord is retakes. Okay? That's the business model that Jesus operates under when it comes to relationships. When it comes to families especially. Retakes aren't the redo of the photo shoot. Retakes are the photo shoot. And they're always ongoing. I brought with me today a picture of my family from 1991 that I was either a junior or a senior in this picture. Can we put that picture up on the screen, Christy? There we are. That's a handsome crew, isn't it? Yeah. No, that's, I, I think I was like 17 or 18 uh, in that picture, but that's, you know, we're all lined up there. I've got my letter jacket on looking all accomplished. Like I've done something with my life at this point, right? Now, you might be sitting here and wondering, Pastor Seth, how do I get my family photo to look as good as that? How do I get them to look as perfectly? I mean, is it the lighting? Is it the exposure? Is it the posing? Is it the, is, is it the setting? What is it? Nah, -uh. it's none of that. It's absolutely none of that. You know how you get to a family picture like this? You work through the family pictures that look like this. Can we go to the next one? Yeah. Future pastor right there. Yeah. It's me and my sister having a moment, enjoying the family photo shoot. That's <laughs> As we're going, that's reality. That's reality, people. Jesus says that the way you go from the chokehold picture to the picture you want to have with your family is retakes. You shoot and you shoot and you shoot. It's called forgiveness, failing and trying again infinitely. So can I give you a couple rules about retakes in, for your family this morning? Is that all right? Rules for retakes because this is a crazy business model for family photography, okay? This is insane. People don't do this, but it's one that we can't do family 
without it. So let me just give you a couple rules for retakes in your family that might help you out. Retake rule number one is that forgiveness is required and only takes one. Reconciliation is optional and only, it, that one always takes two, okay? Forgiveness is required, only takes one. Reconciliation is, is optional and that takes two. Yeah, I think for a lot of people, and Christians in particular, and we do this in church, you guys, we do this all the time. We mix a few things up when it comes to forgiveness. What is it that Jesus says exactly that we should be doing 70 times seven? What does that mean that we're supposed to forgive people? Does it mean that the ways that people hurt us don't matter? And that we should just keep doing the things that we've been doing and giving people chances to hurt us over and over again, that no matter what, you need to stick with it. And there's no consequences. There's no ramifications. There's no ripple effect. Even in situations that are extreme, maybe you've got an abusive situation when it comes to your family or your marriage or an intimate relationship. What about if the same destructive pattern just keeps happening over and over again? Just infinite? Is that how we forgive? Let me give you a definition that I think is going to help you here of forgiveness, okay? Give you a definition of forgiveness. Forgiveness is not letting your offender off the hook, okay? It's not saying that what they did doesn't matter and has no consequence. What forgiveness is, is releasing that person to God and trusting that God will do the right thing with them. That's all it is. It's releasing that person to God and trusting that God will do the right thing with them. Say it with me. Trust them to God. Let's say it again. Trust them to God. Remember Inigo Montoya from the movie The Princess Bride? You remember him? Yeah? You remember who he was always looking for in that movie? Who was he looking for? The six-fingered man, right? The six-fingered, always looking for the six-fingered man. Inigo had a, he had a whole speech prepared for the six-fingered man. You know, he spent years rehearsing it. Do you remember what it was? Say it with me, come on. Hello, my name is Inigo Montoya. You killed my father. Prepare to die. We just became a liturgical church. Isn't that unbelievable? It's so funny. Everybody knows that speech. We all do. At the end... When he finally finds the guy, right, and they have the duel, and, it, and he's screaming it as he's dueling this guy. Hello, my name is Inigo Montoya. You killed my father. Prepare to die. He's screaming it at him, and then it's all over. And at the end of the movie, in Inigo says, I've been in the revenge business so long that I don't know what to do with myself from here. Jesus says, do you know Why? People in the revenge business don't know what to do with themselves after the revenge is over because it's a business you never should have been in. The revenge business is God's business, not yours. You are not in the revenge business. You are also not in the justice business. You are not in the you get what you've got coming to you business. You are not in the but they deserved it business. You are in the retake business. Retakes is your business plan when it comes to relationships. I don't care how many times you've rehearsed that speech in your head. I've got so many speeches in my head for so many people that I've given to the car dashboard so many times as I'm driving down the road. Like, well, I got a whole thing and I'm going to go into it. And I could cite chapter and verse of every single one of them. Jesus says, that's not your business. Forgiveness is the releasing of the offender to God and trusting him to do What's right? Jesus says that we're to love our enemies and pray for those who persecute us or offend us. Why? Why do we just pray for them, Jesus? Because your prayer, listen, they might not change, but when you get before God in prayer about it, you will. You will. He will change you. They don't have to agree with you in order for you to forgive them. They don't. They don't, you, they don't have to agree with your narrative for you to forgive them. They don't, they don't even have to apologize for you to forgive them. Now listen, apologies are nice and they're a part of the process down the line, but they're not necessary for forgiveness. Forgiveness is an act of will 
where you are intentionally deciding, I am going right now in my heart and in my mind to release this person to God. I'm going to take myself out of the judgment seat. I'm going to take myself out of the justice seat. I'm going to take myself out of rehearsed speech mode. And I'm going to take myself out of the administration of right and wrong. And I'm going to do that through a daily process of prayer and action. This is what forgiveness is. And, and watch this. Forgiveness is not something that Jesus says is optional. That, he, he, that you could choose to do it. You could choose to not do it. It doesn't really matter, you know. But you, no, no. After he told Peter that we're supposed to forgive people 70 times 7, like infinite times, Jesus went on in that story and, and, and in that passage, and he told a few stories about forgiveness, including one story about a master who owed a huge debt. And he, wouldn't, he couldn't pay it back, and then the master had forgiveness on him, but then he would not pass that forgiveness on to other people who owed him some stuff and owed him some money and had some debts with him. And this is what Jesus says about that same master. He says in Matthew 18, shouldn't you have mercy on your fellow servant just as I had mercy on you? And then watch this. The angry king sent the man to prison to be tortured until he paid his entire debt. Words of Jesus, okay? That's what my heavenly father will do to you if you refuse to forgive your brothers and sisters from your heart. That's what's going to happen to you. Does this sound like retakes are optional? No. Retakes are definitely not optional. Retakes are mandatory. Forgiveness is required of everybody. Jesus says that unforgiveness, okay, refusing to release that offense, holding on to it, it's fueling me. I feel it working. You know what I mean? Hanging on to that, staying in the revenge business. He says, this is going to be something that tortures you until you learn to let it go. You've got to let it go. It's going to twist you up. It's going to mangle you up. It's going to put you in a posture and in a position where you, it's not just forgiveness you're going to struggle with. It's everything. That's what forgiveness is. So can we all agree forgiveness takes one person and it is not optional. Here's what forgiveness is not, however. Forgiveness is not the same thing as reconciling with someone. Forgiveness only takes one person, and, and, and I can release an offender to God by his grace, with his help, and I can do that all by myself. Only takes me. Reconciliation is completely different. That takes two people in two parties desiring not just a resolution of a conflict, but a restoration of the relationship, okay? Can we be real about this for just a minute here? There are offenses in your life that you can forgive it. I'm not saying it's easy. I'm just saying you can forgive it. But they are really, really, really hard to reconcile. They are. And I'm talking about extreme case, cases and situations of things like betrayal and hurt and abuse. And, and I'm not saying that it can't be done or that God can't do a work between people. I'm just saying it's going to take an extraordinary commitment from both parties to restore that trust and restore that faith that's been broken here. Forgiving someone doesn't always mean that things go back to the way that they were okay, before it happened. That's why Paul said this in, in Romans 12, 18. He said, if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. I think it's really interesting that Paul didn't qualify the live at peace once. He qualifi qualified it twice as he's talking about it, right? He said, if it is possible, number one, as far as it depends on you, number two. The implication that he's really alluding to here is it's not always possible, number one. And number two, number two, you don't get to control other people. So you can be willing to do retakes as much as you want to take retakes, right? But if the other people in the photo shoot don't show up for the picture, you're not going to be able to retake it. 
That, that, that's just the way this works. Paul says, here, here's what I want you to understand. I want you to always be in a posture that's ready to reconcile. I want you to have a soft heart. As far as it depends on you, if it is possible, right? I want you to always be ready to work towards reconciliation. And when it especially comes to your family, you're going to have to have a special measure of grace that is proportional to both the commitment that you have to them positionally and relationally, okay? Positionally and relationally. Your mom is always going to be your mom. Nothing you can ever do will change her position in your life. Your dad is always going to be your dad, no matter what he ever did, what he ever does. Your kids are always going to be your kids. Even for those of us who come from broken families, listen, can, can I just be real with you? Your ex is always going to be your ex. It's true, okay? And listen, listen. As a result, they have pieces of your life you're never going to get back. And if the two of you share kids together, you're always going to be connected, okay? That's never, ever going away. Paul says that even in your family, when it comes to living in peace, okay, reconciliation, you only get to control you. That's all you get. As far as it depends on you, if it is possible, you forgive, you release to God, you walk in the light, you get out of the revenge business. You can do that and you can forgive them, but reconciliation takes two people and repentance and changing a pattern of behavior and a lot of work and rebuilding trust. It takes a number of things that somebody has to work with you on that you can't do that by yourself. So it takes two people to want to reconcile and be utterly, completely, like blinders on, committed for that to happen. But you only get to control you. So if someone says to you that I really want to live at peace with you, but their actions do not convey a peaceful posture, right? And they continue to behave in the same hurtful way. It's a little bit like Vladimir Putin telling the people of Ukraine, hey, when this whole like bombing thing is over, I really hope we can be friends. I just really hope we can like, <laughs> we can like walk together in peace and be like side by side together, right? Like, hey, Vlad, we forgive you. Like we, we can, we, for our own sake, we have to forgive you, right? It's going to torture us. These feelings are too big. It's going to torture us if we don't. If, so if it is possible, as far as it depends on us, we're going to live at peace. But the damage your bombs are continuing to do, we would need something different from you in terms of what we can see with our eyeballs and an action, right, to have reconciliation. Is that making sense to you guys? Forgiveness and reconciliation are not the same thing. Forgiveness takes one, reconciliation takes both. You only get to control you. That's retake rule number one. Retake rule number two. Forgiveness is not a one-time event. It's a daily surrender. Daily surrender. A lot of people think that with most things, they're a part of living in the Christian life. That, that we have a very kind of linear way of thinking about it. You know what I mean? Very sequential. In, in other words... Living the Christian life is sort of a series of boxes to be checked or a series of th like a to-do list that, that once we check them off, these issues are never revisited and we never have to do them again and we just kind of pass the test and we move on to the next thing. Like, like living for Jesus is sort of like about getting Boy Scout badges or Girl Scout badges up and down your, your little sachet that you wear to church, you know, that thing. I got my joy badge today. Never have to worry about my joy going away because I've got the joy of the Lord. It's my strength. I passed the joy test. What's the next one? The patience test? I can do that. It's going to take me a while. But once I get there, I am now a patient person because I am a Christian. And therefore, I am patient. How many of you know life is, it doesn't work like that. It is not that linear. This is not how it works. Retakes are never one and done. That's why Jesus said to Peter, not seven times, but 77 times. Like seven times, seven, again. 
infinite, infinite times. When it comes to most things, and forgiveness especially, this is something we're going to have to do infinitely. It is never one and done. Well, I forgave them for that. So I guess that's the end of that issue in my life, right? Never going to have to struggle with that again. Jesus says, I'm talking daily, Jack, okay? Every single day, moment to moment. Have you ever been going along fine in your life, just walking through your day, and then all of a sudden you think about something and remember something, or someone's name comes up on your phone? <gasps> ah! You see that? It interrupts your peace. I was living at peace. And then, ah, there it is, right? I was fine two minutes ago, and, and now I'm not. Something happens where you remember something, or if I'm in a completely different season of life now, right? And, and, and what happened, what the person did to me, it was years ago, but it affects me differently in this season than it did in the season that I just came out of. It's hitting different today than it did yesterday, and I can't explain it but I'm finding myself inexplicably angry. Has that ever happened to you? Inexplicably depressed. I, I don't know where that came from. Inexplicably anxious. Like you, I, 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 I don't know. I don't know why I'm kind of antsy and, and jumpy. I, I don't know what's going on. All of a sudden, we get triggered, and we don't know why. And we can think about it. Like, look, I, I, I forgave them. I got the forgiveness badge. Right? I, I understand. We, we did the retakes. Why am I still struggling with it again? Where's this coming from? Being in a family is being involved in a web of relationships that you guys know this. It's always evolving. It's always moving. It's always changing. It's always moving in one direction. Time never stops. People grow old. Kids grow up. Circumstances change. Your family's position to you never changes, but the circumstances around those positions do. So Jesus says, Peter, we can't have a hard and fast rule about how many times you should forgive somebody. We can't put a hard and fast limit on it. We can't, we can't have it where you're going to forgive something and do retakes here, but then something new happens, and I can't promise you you're not going to have to reshoot the same picture, right? You might have to reshoot the shot at a, as, as, as a better and healthier family today, than you were a year ago or 10 years ago, okay? I, I, I don't need a family picture from five years ago to remind me of what my job and what my responsibility and what my priorities need to be today. I need one that comes from today. I, I, I need a picture of my marriage that, that's going to be not the picture that we were at the altar. Those are kids. They're different people. I need a family picture for today, which means I need some retakes with my husband or my wife that reflects who we are today. Not who we were originally. Not who we were when, when the kids were born today. That's going to mean retakes. And retakes are going to mean forgiveness. We do such a disservice in the church when we tell people to just forgive and forget. Just forgive and forget. Just do it. Just let it go. Just ah. Like it's all going to just magically go away. You shouldn't be struggling with that abuse in your family. You shouldn't be struggling with what happened to you years ago. You shouldn't be struggling with that thing that happened between you and your kids or you and your spouse or whatever. You forgave it. Just move forward and forget it. Just release it. Listen, you know this. Emotional memory doesn't work like that. It just doesn't. Psychologists have actually discovered that when someone has a significant trauma that happens in their life, their actual emotional development their internal framework, their maturation, and their growth process as a person, it stops right where you are until you've dealt with that trauma in your life. So, if you were 15 when you were abused, I'm just gonna tell you, until you deal with that and walk through that, it, it's gonna be a thing. You might emotionally be 45 years old, or you physically be 45 years old. Emotionally, you're still back at 15. And, and that's a problem. So we've got to figure this out. Emotional memory doesn't work in relation to time the same way that other kinds of memory does. This is the reason that you can be going along fine and then all of a sudden you remember something and man, it's like it was 30 seconds ago. Have you noticed that? 
That's, that's the reason for that. It could have been 10 years ago, but I feel it like it just happened. And all these emotions come rushing back like it was just not even a minute ago when it happened. So what do we need to do when that happens? We need to do a retake. We need to forgive it again and again and again and again, daily, hourly, moment by moment, time after time, day after day, you've got to forgive it so we avoid the torture that Jesus is talking about unless you forgive them from your heart. Until you work through, the, through those emotions, until you work through that offense, until you process this in your relationship with a lot of hard work, until you work through what happened and understand how it's affecting you today, right here, right now, you're going to live in unforgiveness. And that's a bad place to live. Not just theologically, okay? But it's a bad place to live in your own spirit, in your emotions. You're going to be stuck in the past and unable to move forward emotionally until you deal with the forgiveness that you need to walk in today. And that's why rule number three is so important. Retake rule number three. Forgiveness keeps the battle for one another instead of against one another. There's a big difference between walking with someone in such a way that says, I'm going to fight for you and walking with someone in such a way that says, I'm going to fight against you. Listen to what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 13. Listen, as families, when we create families at weddings, okay, this is one of the most famous chapters that we read. This is often the passage of scripture that you get quoted at weddings because it's all about how love is patient, love is kind. It does not, it has no like pride, right? It keeps no record of wrongs. You have to remember that Paul was never married. He may not know how marriage works here, you know. <laughs> he doesn't know. We're going to have to give him a pass. Keeping records of wrongs is what marriage is all about, okay? <laughs> but this is how he closes out that passage. And, and, and don't gloss this over as we leave here today. He says in 1 Corinthians 13 that when I was a child, I spoke and thought and reasoned as a child. But when I grew up, look at your neighbor and say, it's time to grow up. Yeah, some of you said that a little bit too happily, right? <laughs> it's time to grow up. It's time to grow up. It's just time to grow up. I put childish things away. Now we see things imperfectly, like puzzling reflections in a mirror. But then we will see everything with perfect clarity. All that I know now is partial and incomplete. But then I will know everything completely, just as God now knows me completely. There's three things that last forever. Faith, hope, and love. The greatest of these is love. There's a lot going on here in this passage that we don't have time to get into today, but, but here's what I want to draw your attention to, okay? I just want to sift it down to this. Paul says that the process of maturing, putting childish things away, putting them behind you, is what we are called to do. And that means working through the hurts from the past that keep us stuck in those childish ways that he's talking about, that keep us stuck in younger, older, different versions of ourselves and relationships. Paul says that immaturity, immaturity really stems from seeing yourself any other way than how God sees you. That's just immaturity. That's why he, he told Timothy later on in, in 1 Timothy chapter 4, he, he, he told him to be an example to, the, to, to everybody uh, in, in terms of his life, his speech, his conduct, his purity, and to not let anyone look down on him because he's young. Why? Because maturity has nothing to do with your physical age. It has to do with what you've worked through. That's the difference. God made Jesus available to everybody. Forgiveness is available to everyone and anyone all the time, in every season, 
all seasons. Does that mean that all people are reconciled to God in relationship to, Je in relationship to Jesus? No. Why? Because just because it's available doesn't mean that it's practiced. Reconciliation takes you and I wanting the same thing that God wants in this relationship. Seeing our own brokenness and wanting to be reconciled to him through Jesus. We have to participate in that process. What God has done for Jesus, for us in Jesus, is he said, listen, I need you to understand. I'm not fighting against you. I'm fighting for you. I need you to see it. I'm fighting for us. I'm fighting for our family. This is what I'm willing to sacrifice. This is how hard I'll work. This is how I'll deal with the hurt. I'm willing to come to grips with what happened and we're gonna do it this way. I will shoot retake after retake after retake after retake until our family picture has everybody in it that it's supposed to have in it and we look the way we're supposed to look. Unconditional, infinite, 70 times seven kind of retakes. That's how God approaches his family. But you will never live in that same kind of relationship with the people in your family if you can't learn to mature and if you can't learn to see both yourself and other people the way God sees them. I'm going to tell you right now, If you can't learn to see the people in your life that you have the biggest conflicts with through God's eyes instead of your own, you will never fight for them. You will always fight against them. Always. Paul says learning to see people like that takes time. It takes maturity. It takes some work. But until you enter that process, you're going to continue to only see partially. And what you will see will keep you fighting against the very people that God would have you fighting for. Some of us, we get so distracted by unforgiveness, silly fights, stuff that we can't let go. We get so distracted that we're not fighting the battles that we really should be fighting. You're fighting a battle that's distracting you from the real work of God in your life. Paul says in, in 1 Timothy 6.12 that we're supposed to fight the good fight. Fight the good fight for the true faith. Hold tightly to the eternal life to which God has called you, which you have declared so well before many witnesses. Fight the good fight. You know what fight the good fight means? It means stop fighting the petty fight. Stop fighting the immature fight. Stop fighting the fight for power. Stop fighting the selfish fight. Stop fighting the thoughtless fight. Grow up. Grow up. Deal with your stuff. Time to stop fighting the fight that your mama and daddy had that you grew up watching your entire life. Stop fighting the battle to be right. Stop fighting the battle to be vindicated or justified or the battle about how this family picture is going to look to other people. We wouldn't want other people to think it's not perfect. In your family, with your people, you fight the good fight. You grab a hold of what God has called you to. You fight for your kids. You fight for your spouse. You fight for the best in each other. You fight off attack together. You fight for purpose. You fight for calling. Fight for building something great with your family. That's a fight, man. That's a battle. Fight for each other. We fight to protect each other, not tear each other down. We fight towards forgiveness. We fight to live towards each other the way that God lived towards us. We show up for retakes every single day. There is nothing at all that is instant or insta about that process. Nothing. But that's how families are built. Retakes aren't something we do after the shoot. Retakes are the shoot. And we do them all day long. Jesus, would you 
send us forward from here and build your family? Would you build each one of us with a sense of grace, a sense of mercy, a sense of dignity, a sense of wellness that only comes from you? May we leave this place and do so not as people who got our forgiveness badge and we're ready to move forward, but as people who understand that the fight to walk in forgiveness with the people closest to us is the fight for our lives. We give our families to you. We trust them to you. Teach us how to do them well. We pray these things in your name. Amen.